when we are being commanded. Uh, when, when we are commanded, we're being commanded to live. What, about, what, what do you think when, when you say the Lord is commanding us to live holy? We're being commanded to live holy. So what do we demise from that? Go ahead. Go ahead. Huh? Say it again. Okay. Ain't no wrong answer. What what did you say? What did you say, sir? Did you say okay? Um, I use the analogy like on your job. You can ask your people to do something. Uh huh. Or when you give them um, um, instructions. Okay. You're telling them. He's you're telling them. You're telling them. Telling them. Telling them. What what to do? Right. If if I if I if I'm responsible for you, if I have authority over you, then if I have the authority to give you, and if I give you instruction, and if I command you to do something, then that means that I am also going to give you the authority to do it. And so what we find in Jesus is he commands us. Amen? He commands us to be holy. Commands us to live right. He said, go thee in all the earth, you know, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. You know, commanding them to observe all the things that I've said. Then he said, even until, he said, and I, and lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the earth. So if the Lord is then telling us, he's commanding us to live holy, then he is saying he is with us. So what then would be our purpose? Our focus. Okay. Go ahead. Also, you said, what is our focus? focus. Our focus is living holy. Okay. Um, uplifting, spreading the good news. Of living holy, spreading the good news. That's good, sis. Okay. Now, again, the advantage we have that the apostles and the first century church didn't have, we have the completed word. So we've got all the promises that God intended for us to have. I heard the Lord say through Peter, he said, when you got saved, you were given Everything, all things that pertain to holiness, did he not? And power. So he gave you everything that you need to be holy. Gave us everything we need to live a life that is pleasing to him. Amen. Mankind to show us that it is possible to be done. And that's where we're going. Praise the Lord for that comment. We're doing a series now, and we're gonna we're gonna be in this thing for a moment. We're gonna be in this thing for a moment. It's called Molded by the Master. And it is a if you want to get the the, the power of the gospel, greatest preacher that ever preached was Jesus Christ. Greatest sermon ever preached, the Sermon on the Mount. Greatest miracles ever performed, performed by Jesus. Greatest leader there ever was. Greatest quotes there ever have been told were told by him. 
not necessarily the Bible itself. The entire Bible speaks to God. The entire Bible speaks to Christ. It speaks to his being. It speaks to his majesty. But if you want to walk on water, and by that I mean living a Holy Ghost-filled, obedient life, you want to study the Gospels. Study what Jesus said. Watch what he did. You want to pattern yourself after him. Well, because what did he say? He told the disciples, these things you see me doing. He said, greater things than these shall you do. Why? Because I go to the Father. So when he went back to glory, the job being finished, then it is not that we're going to ever be greater than him. What he meant by that, we would have access that he didn't have. We would have the ability to travel that he did not take advantage of. Now, remember, he was God. He was, he was Jesus the man, but he was also God. So if he wanted to, he could have went any way he wanted to. But he chose a natural existence for the most part. He didn't fly nowhere. He didn't disappear on, in Africa and then reappear in Germany. When he went, when he went somewhere, he walked. The only time he ever rode was when he rode the donkey from Bethany into Jerusalem on Palm Friday, on Palm Sunday. So, well, even when Jesus was riding on the boat, Jesus was really riding from one from one uh, side of the of the Gal of the Sea of Galilee or the Jordan River to the other. He wasn't traveling the Atlantic. He wasn't traveling the Pacific, the, the Pacific. When Jesus was on the ship, he was only going from one side of, of, of the sea, of the land, of the area he was in, to the other side. But then he said, Peter said in Peter 1, 2 Peter 1, according as his divine power had given unto us all things, all things, that pertain unto life, and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory. You want that glory? Then you've got to learn of him. He said you've been given, we have been given according as his divine power had given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. But you can't stop there. Because the scripture says, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. So number one, this is about living holy. This is about a life of holiness. This is about being called. If God didn't call you, this is not even, he's not even talking to you. If this is not about you living holy, He's not even talking to you. How do I know? Because he said, uh, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious, what? Promises. 2 Peter 1, 4. That by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature. Of his divine nature. Again, you are not going to partake anything until you first learn it. We are not going to get holiness through osmosis. What do I mean by osmosis? It's not dropping out of the sky into your head. Jesus said you've got to, you've got to work out your own soul salvation. Through what? Fear, reverence, and trembling. Taking it serious. So he says, being partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Through lust, We have to divest ourselves of what the world is doing. You can't have one foot in the world and one foot in the church and think you're holy. I mean, we're in this age now 
where we can live against scripture and then call ourselves Christians. You can't support a lifestyle that is against the Bible and then call yourself a Christian. And I, I heard the bishop say something the other night that I 100% agree with. Here is an oxymoron. There is no such thing. Don't get it twisted. There is no such thing in existence as a Christian homosexual. That's right. There is no such thing as a Christian lesbian. If you are actively involved in a homosexual lifestyle, you're not a Christian. Now, having said that, let me add this. Don't just dump it all on the homosexuals. You're not living in sin and, and call yourself a Christian. Jesus says, if you love me, you keep my word. You can't live an active, sinful life. We like to jump on the homosexuals. What about the whoremongers? What about the thieves? What about the liars? What about the cheats? He is saying his divine nature, the, the nature of God is not about any of these things. He said you have to rid yourself of the corruption, the corruption that is in the world through lust. Either going to serve God or you're not. You are not going to live this 2018 Christian existence and then think you're going to operate in God's divine nature. You might look the part. You might wear the outfit. You might put on the clergy collar. You might have the parking stall. But when you get to the gate, like my daughter say, when you get to the pearly gate, these are going to be some of the people that Jesus is going to say to them, depart from me. You supported everything I was against. I've got relatives. They're gay. Well, homosexual. Ain't nothing gay about it. I've got relatives that are homosexual that I love dearly. But I tell them, you got to go down that road by yourself. I'm praying for you that God would deliver you. And that's why when people walk into this church, Folks come in here, they are not saved. They're coming in here as they are. With love and kindness have I drawn them. But we're not conforming to that lifestyle. Like we told the couple one time, two times. The homosexual couple. You don't come in here. We love you. But you can't come in here and be sitting there hugging. The young men and the young women that are not married. God bless you. We love you. Come on in and fellowship with us. But you're not sitting over there hugging. I don't sit over there hugging my wife and I'm married. Not in church. This is God's house. There is nothing sanctified about the church anymore with people. But they think that they are Christians and they think that God is honoring them. Watch this. He said, beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. Virtue is character. Character is being honest. I mean, we all have dropped the ball at one point or another. But virtue means you have character. Then it says, God bless you to the saints coming in. Add to your giving all diligence, add to your uh, faith virtue, virtue, knowledge, to knowledge, temperance, to temperance, patience, patience, godly, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness and brotherly kindness charity we got to treat folks that are not saved you got to treat them right you think for one minute that a person living in sin is going to let you preach to them 
and you treat and talk to them like dirt. You, I don't preach in people's life. That's never been my style. I'm going to preach the gospel. Now, the gospel will find you. I don't have to sit here and preach nobody's life. Matter of fact, I've had people come up to me after, after service and try to explain something to me that they were doing in their life. And I had to stop them and say, you may not believe this. I have no idea what you're talking about. Neither do I want to. That's you and God. That's your conscious. That's the Holy Spirit working on your conscious. And so, and that's the way it should be. Amen. When God's word go out, he said it's not coming back void. But we got to love people to the point where they will listen to you. If I care for you, if I show you love and kindness, if I demonstrate for you that I really care, which means helping you when you're in need, ministering to you when nobody else will, being there for you when everybody else has turned you down. I don't mean to the point where you're using us, but, but being honest. People know when you're for real. You be a blessing to people, and then it's a look people have, Sister Jessica, when they expect you to say thank you. They got this look when they do something for you. If they have this look, you should be saying thank you. Then, they then we turn around and say, I did it as unto the Lord. Well, if you did it as unto the Lord, you should be looking for no thank you. Amen. <laughs> Are you with me? Amen. Now, it's not the wrong with people saying thank you. But if they don't, guess what? I don't feel like I got taken advantage of because I did what I did Amen. as unto the Lord. Yes. At least they'll come back one more time. <laughs> and I can preach again. I like to preach. Oh, they'll come back one more time. And if you treat them right, they'll come back again. Yes, yes. And one of these days, they're going to sit there and get delivered. Yes. Oh, bless the name of the yes, Lord. Yes. So what we want to do empower our lives by living a life that Christ lived. Are you with me? So the series that we are in is called Molded by the Master. We're in the book of Matthew. We're going to walk through this book chapter by chapter, verse by verse. We're in chapter 3 tonight. We preached chapter 2 Sunday. We studied chapter 1 Last week in Bible study, we'll preach chapter 4 Sunday. Is that right? Is that okay, Treyon? Amen. Matthew chapter 3. Let's read it. In those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. And he went out to him into Jerusalem, all Judea and all the region around Jordan, and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits, meat for repentance. And think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you, that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth forth not good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. 
But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and garner his sweet unto the garner, but he will burn up the shaft with unquenchable fire. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of you. And cometh thou to me? And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now. But thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water. And lo, the heavens were opened unto him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. We talked last week, chapter 2 dealt with the birth. We, 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 we preached the message on Sunday. God, the guardian of us all. How God protected the birth, the childhood, and the early life of Jesus Christ. Remember, he was God incarnate, but he was operating as the Savior. Come in the flesh. So he was living for the most part as a man. So God protected his existence. God protected the existence of Moses. Did he not? God protected the, the, uh, their wandering in the desert. God protected David. God has protected you. You have not made it this far in your life without God's protection. So in the same manner... Jesus lived by faith, but he had to trust in God's divine principle and God's plan for salvation. Otherwise, there is no atonement for our sins, and we are still in our sin. But he did do what he did. He was born of Mary. He did flee with his mother and father into Egypt running from Herod. He did come back and fleeing from the second Herod wound up in Nazareth. And so we find ourselves in chapter 3 where we've got John coming to announce Jesus' coming. Now, John and Jesus are almost about the same age. We know this because Mary and Elizabeth were cousins. Mary went to visit Elizabeth while she was yet pregnant with John. So we know from this that John and Jesus are similar in age. I don't believe they've had contact with each other up until now. Jesus being in a controlled, structured environment, Jesus spent his childhood up around the uh, around the uh, around the church. He was in the church. They found Jesus most often, uh, and, and that's right. He was in church. He was preaching. He was teaching. He said, uh, when Mary and Joseph were looking for him, when he was lost, he said, did you not know I was about my father's business? John, on the other hand, according to scripture, John is living in the wild. John has lived, has, 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 has his early days consisted of a life of solitude. John is mighty in the Lord. You know why John is mighty in the Lord? Because John lived a secluded life. I think our lives would be far more powerful 
spiritually if we had less distraction. Amen. I think if, if, if you lived out in the wilderness, I think we would be far more spiritual than we are. Now, it doesn't, it's not, it doesn't mean you have to be that way. You can live in New York City and be holy if you purpose to. But I believe that John living a secluded life, he was able to spend time with God. You want to be strong in the Lord, you're going to have to spend some time Amen. with God. We want to be mighty in God. We don't want to pray. We want to walk on water. We don't want to fast. We want to serve God when it is convenient. When we say to ourselves, well, I will purpose to be here on a certain day, then we'll be there. And then when we don't, we won't. And, and, and it's not okay with God, but God understands what we do and how we do it. Amen? Yes, ma'am. I have a question. Okay. Um, when I look at from the spiritual realm. When you look at from the spirit realm. From the spiritual realm. Look at Jesus' life. And like you were saying as a child when he was in the synagogue teaching, preaching the, you know, teaching the gospel. Okay. Okay. And he taught them for the place in my remember now, he taught them. All right. They spent a lot of time being taught. Okay. And praying. Okay. Remember when he would go to pray, he would tell them to pray. What he, they, we, they'd be over there asleep somewhere. Now, if he command us, right? Command us uh -huh. to do great things. And I'm just saying, Sister Reddick, everybody ain't built like that. But I think about when we got saved in Hawaii. And we didn't have nowhere to go. We could only go to one end of that, that island. We on an island, right? We didn't have a lot of distractions. I think about when I worked, and I did uh, labor work. Okay. And you just had the purpose. This is where you are in the Lord. You have the purpose in your heart, right? You don't just get saved and just run out there and just be all over the place. You know, like the, the scripture clearly says, a double mind, man, it's just unstable. So where does stableness come in, come in, being in the Lord? Why do you think God commanded? He has a, uh, what is it, uh, Pastor, what would you call it? a structure for us? But the one, and you, you're 100% right. He's talking about that he has given us power to do, but when we so consumed with everything, yes, we have to work. Yes, we have families. Yes, we have it. But it's a balance. Because when I got saved, remember now, I worked at the men's hall. I remember I started out because I was on the bottom tap floor. You remember, I could not be in church like that on Sunday. And I began to pray. And the Lord opened the door where I was able to be in church on because he seen the desires of my heart. And he provided those. We never went lacking in nothing. But, it, but again, you are right. It is a personal choice. Again, John, being raised in the wilderness, John didn't have to. John could have came into the city if he chose to. Just as those of us that live in city dwellings doesn't prevent you from committing yourself to God. It just depends on how close to God you want to be. If you want a mediocre relationship, with God, then put forth mediocre effort. See, the things we don't, the things, oh, let me say this. I will grant you the things that we spend a lot of our time away from church doing, God would do them for us okay. if we committed more time to God. So what we find, John, John is in the wilderness John has a plan. John has a task too. John has a task that, that uh, believe it or not, God, Jesus commended John by name. Said John was, was, was blessed. And the fact that 
he being who he was. God commended the life that John lived when all, when all, all John lived to do was to announce the coming of Jesus. He was preaching the gospel and he died for the sake of the gospel. But that was okay. Eternal life sometimes comes at that price. But what was he coming and doing? It's now time for the gospel to be preached. Jesus is now an adult. When we're in, when we're in chapter 2, Jesus is a child. The wise men have, are, are, are coming to find him. Herod is trying to find him. He kills all the children. In Jerusalem, two years old and younger, because he was trying to find and kill Jesus, because Jesus threatened his existence. Jesus threatened his existence. Jesus also threatened the existence of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So the Jews and Herod, they both came together and they conspired against Jesus and they still lost. In the end, Jesus said, nobody took my life. I gave it. But now we see Jesus as an adult. We're going to see in these next chapters in Matthew how Jesus lived. I want you to watch. I've given you, I've given y'all an outline. I want you to keep these outlines. Uh, uh, we're going to use them. I'm going to give you an outline for each chapter. What it's going to do it's going to start out giving you points to ponder. Then it's going to ask you questions that we're going to be able to answer by the end of tonight's lesson. So, you want to find these things that will turn, you ought to be saying, God, somewhere in this teaching, Lord, turn on the light. Turn on the light. And, 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 and put me in a place where I'm sold out. And I'm praying. My prayer every morning as I pray for the church is that, Lord, we'll catch on fire. But you want to pattern yourself. And here's what's important. Look at the, pay attention to the promises that Jesus makes. Pay attention to the assurances that we get in the Bible. There are assurances that God gives us in the Bible. I mean, if you want to, if, man, you want to find some promises and some assurances in the Bible, go study them 150 Psalms. Boy, God then gave some, God then gave you some promises and assurances that you will, you will never be able to get them all in the Psalms alone. And you still got 66 of the books or 65 but what we're going to find here is what John is telling them to repent now notice in verse 2 John is telling them repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand now watch this by the time Jesus starts to preach he is not going to be preaching that the kingdom of God is at hand he is going to be preaching that the kingdom of God is here. Now, here is my question for you, Bible students. What is the kingdom of God anyway? What is the kingdom of God? John is preaching here. Verse 2, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, I'm going to give you one that we're not going to go back and forth on. When you see the kingdom of God and when you see the kingdom of heaven, what's the difference? What is the difference in the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven? There is no difference. There is no difference. When you hear them talk about the kingdom of God versus the kingdom of heaven, watch when Jesus is using it. When Jesus is using it, when he is around the Sanhedrin, when he is around the Pharisees, he will always normally use the term the kingdom of heaven. Why? Because any time he mentions God is when the Jews would accuse him of blasphemy. Amen? So, 
He is saying here that the kingdom of God is at hand. Then, he is, as we know, the front runner. He's the front runner. His, his mission is to go before the Lord and announce, we are front runners. Our mission is to go before the Lord and announce, salvation is here. We ought to be rhetorical like Noah was. Noah was rhetorical. Noah didn't have to say a word. He just built that ark for 120 years. That was his preaching. That was his sermon. Building an ark that God told him to build, that everybody around him ridiculed him for, and said, this guy must be a fool. He's building a boat, and they had never had rain. There had never been rain on the earth as Noah was building the ark. Until God told Noah to get in and he shut up the ark. They had never seen rain. So imagine in 2018, you have people now that are so, what did, what, what did um, Paul say, 2 Corinthians 4, 3? He said, if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost and whom the God of this world have blinded the minds of them that believe not, lest the glorious gospel of Christ should shine on them and they should be converted. So we, you know how many millions of times we've said uh, Jesus is soon to come? We've been preaching Jesus is soon to come for 2,000 years. Because from the day he left, he promised to come back. So by now, people are complacent. Even Christians in the church are asleep. They're not thinking that the Lord is soon to come. They seem to think they're going to get sick. Everybody's going to get sick. And God is going to give us six months to repent while we're laying in our hospital bed. You got to be careful about those bedside conversions. You don't know how sincere your own heart is. How many of us have watched people get saved only to see them six months later or a year later, they're back out there in the world? And they say, well, in my heart, I believed in my heart that I got saved. Well, I got one word for you there, friend. The Lord say that the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Don't stop believing your heart and start believing God's word. This is the problem with the church today. They are following their heart and, and the other half is following their head. But nobody's following the book. And I don't care what kind of book you go and buy. You go to the store, I go to the store, I buy a book. I buy a book for the purpose of getting that information. I'm going to believe that book. But when we read in the Bible, what God has said in the Bible, as soon as we get through reading it, we start switching the words around in the meaning, saying what God meant instead of what the word said. So John is saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That means it is here. It is here now. The parable of the ten virgins is a real lesson that we should learn. Because when the Lord comes, some folks are going to get left out. They're going to be outside in the dark with no light. Because they think God is coming tomorrow. Or they think God is coming next year. But when they have a massive stroke and they wake up, and they're standing before either God in his glory or God in his wrath. It's over. Your kingdom of hand is done. We got folks, I'm waiting on the Lord. When you go out there tonight 
And I heard Jesus say, thou fool, this night thou soul is required of thee. Then as far as you are concerned, the Lord is coming back then. John is saying, the kingdom of heaven is now. You need to be getting ready now. You need to be living your life now as if God is coming tonight. And you can't live one way and then profess something else. And I will tell you why. You will only live that that you believe. You will only live those things you believe. You're not trusting God with anything until you believe that God will do it. You're not trusting in biblical principle unless you believe God to do it. And when we don't trust God to do it, we never know God will do it. The best thing for faith is answered prayer. The more God answers your prayer, the greater your faith becomes. I made the mistake, Sister Lassiter, several, many times, saying, Lord, just strengthen my faith. Boy, you better be careful when you say that. Because then God puts you in positions that only he can deliver you from. Money can't help you. Friends can't help you. A job can't help you. Doctor can't help you. You're sitting there in the midnight hour. And the only thing you can do is trust Jesus. Then he delivers. So then God is saying, now you know I delivered. And if I delivered once, I'll do it again. So how do I know he's delivered once? Well, in addition to what I've seen with my eyes and experienced in my own life, I got this thing right here from Genesis to Revelation of things that God has done. Okay. And he's the same God. Well, Everybody got to live by faith. Right, that's what I'm saying. But like you were saying about, um, like you were saying, God had manifest itself in different ways to us. Like you were saying, there were times when we know we had no money in the bank, and the Lord would just leave us go and check the account, and money just. And, and, and these, bad. I mean, and, and these are the super, the and these are the superficial yeah. things. I mean, we found ourselves in places where we had to trust God. When we opened this church, it was God. It was all God. The people told us when we got to this town, you will never get this building. Them, they said, matter of fact, the exact words was, them white folks is not going to give you this building. And I remember saying, you're right. They're not going to give it to me. God is going to give it to us. And here we are. If you never trust him, then you will never be able to stand tall in the Lord. You will always trust in your own strength. And it goes back to what David said in Psalms 33 and, and 16. He says, there is no king saved by the multitude of a host. A mighty man is not delivered by much strength. A horse is a vain thing for safety. Neither shall he deliver any by his great strength. You, uh, the Bible says that except the Lord build the city, build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord watch the city, the watchman waketh, but in vain. We've got to learn to trust God. In spite of, then we can move in God's direction at God's time. That is the only way you're going to be in place when the Lord comes. Folks are going to miss out. I'm telling you, Sister Lassie, they're going to miss out because they're lukewarm. They're lukewarm already. And they're saying, one day I'm going to catch on fire. But then we're not doing the things that are necessary to catch on fire. Let's look at what John did. 
John, the Bible, verse 3 says, this is one that, number one, he is fulfilling prophecy by, that was spoken by Isaiah. Isaiah prophesied thousand years before John came on to the scene that he would be the front runner and that he would be the voice in the wilderness saying prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight his path. Then John has an instant congregation. John has an instant following. Verse 5 says, now, as wild looking as John had to be. Now, he's got on animal skins for clothes. And he's wearing this leather girdle around his waist. He's a vegetarian. He's eating bugs and honey. Even in that existence, the people thronged to him. Now imagine the Sadducees and how they were dressed and how they looked. Probably, I don't even know how John would have smelled. I'm sure he was a, you know, he, 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 he took care of how he smelled, but how he looked, how he was dressed was not a, 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 was, was not a big time consuming thing for him. Also, you've got to consider the time that he lived in. These were desert dwellers. People during this period of time, they traveled a lot in caravans. They walked. And so it was not unusual for them to be dusty and dirty. And there weren't no hotels back in these days. So I'm sure they slept on the road. So John was not in and of himself a eyesore when he came to town. But in all of that, the Bible says he went first to Jerusalem, the capital. He went to New York City. And preached his gospel. He had an instant following. The Bible said he went from Jerusalem. Around Judea. All around the Jordan. And he began baptizing. Something that people had not ever seen before. They had no idea. What baptism was. But they saw this guy doing something different that nobody else was doing. And then by doing that, they heard him preaching when nobody else was preaching. And God had given John anointing. We don't have any word other than we know John was filled with the spirit because the Bible says that he was filled with the spirit while he was yet in his mother's womb. So when you get that Holy Ghost, you're ready. The only thing that will prevent you from operating in God's strength with the Holy Ghost is if you quench it. Paul said into the Corinthians, quench not the spirit. Why? Because scripture says the spirit is subject to the prophet. The Holy Spirit is not going to make you do something you don't want to do. It will empower you to do what God is directing you to do. But it is not going to do something that you don't want it to do and against your will. So Paul said quench not the spirit. So he's operating with the gift. And he's baptizing. And people are coming. And he's saying something. That they've not heard before. John is saying something. That people are hearing. That they've never heard before. What was he saying? Verse 6. And were baptized of him in Jordan. Confessing their sins. John was calling them to repentance. Scripture says. Um, in verse 2. His message 
repent. For the kingdom of God is at hand. The Jews knew scripture. They knew scripture had prophesied that the kingdom of heaven was coming. And here John is. Two of the most unlikely characters you wanted to see. If you are a Pharisee or Jew. Number one. They was expecting Jesus to come in the power of David. They thought Jesus was coming in with a group of enforcers and was going to cause Rome to surrender to his authority. That was not his thing. And then when they seen John coming, they thought John was coming to preach a gospel that would deliver them in, in, in the law. Well, the law was getting ready to go away. They was preaching against what the law was teaching because the law served one purpose, to demonstrate to the Jews and to us all that we were sinners. We couldn't ride to heaven on the law. So Jesus is, so, Paul, so John is coming to tell them the gospel that has been prophesied since the Garden of Eden is now. And so here he is baptizing. And what happens in verse 7? The church folks see him. Oh boy. What happens when church folks come around? And you got unchurched people around. The unchurched people are standing there like, what in the world is going on here? You got this side of the church saying one thing, that side of the church saying something else, and, and the poor unsaved person sitting in the middle, and then at the end they get up and leave and say, I don't want no part in either one of them. <laughs> are you with me? You got, if you are a Christian, you should have one message. You can't have one message for this group and another message for that group. You can't have a message for your work crowd, a different message for your church crowd. Oh, 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 and watch this. A whole nother message for your family members. <laughs> oh, we got some family members that are way out there. And we got a whole different gospel for them. Why? Because they're my cousin. There's a different gospel for my cousin. When I'm at work, I'm walking on eggshells because I don't want to offend people that's not saved. I don't want to offend people that's gay or, or that's homosexual because it's classical to be homosexual these days. And you got to remember now what the, what the world is saying is that the problem with, with, with sin is the church folks. That we would, the world is saying, we would be fine if it wasn't for them one or two church folks that keep preaching what the Bible is saying. Well, if you're going to represent God and you won't preach what the Bible is saying, then Jesus has a word for you, not me. Jesus has a word for you. He said, the fool said in his heart, there is no God. If you, if you are a Christian and you won't stand on God's word, you got to be a miserable person. Why? You're being accused of being a Christian. You're being associated with being a Christian. But you're not getting any of the benefit of the most powerful God, Yahweh. God is the sustainer of all life. You can't lose with God. Now, some people are not given to openly professing their faith. I get that. But don't sit in a crowd and people asking you your opinion and you start opinionating things that are clearly not in the Bible. If you don't, if you're not going to, if you are going to call yourself a believer 
but then you are not going to stand for what's in the Bible, then go somewhere by yourself and don't say nothing. But don't profess to be saved. You cannot. You got a local political race. This one politician clearly is saying, I'm going to make it my business to enforce same-sex marriage. Now, it doesn't matter what Mike Reddick thinks. If I'm supporting God, I can't support that. I had a relative that I didn't vote for. Because if I got a choice between God's hell and my relative's hell, I'll take my relative's hell. I'm sticking with God. I'll take my chances with the relative's hell. You're either going to promote God's gospel or you're not. And we're in a day now where people, you know, the covers are being pulled off. You can't be both. But the problem people are having is they're purporting to support everybody's agenda. If you're going to say you're going to support everybody's agenda, then they're going to expect you to support it. Well, you can't, uh, that's, in, that's impossible because Scripture clearly says that you can't serve two gods. Thank you. Great, great so point. My thing is, my thing, I get it. Um, on the job, they might not want, you know, like, I can respect you don't want me to preach the devil. But don't come over here bothering me because I want to praise my God either. Because I don't care what job I have. And that, and that is always... And that's the way it is with me. I remember I was in a situation where the, one of the young ladies, uh, Sister McClain, my past wife, was working for this, um, what is it, old folks' uh, uh, place? Assisted living. Young, assisted living. Yeah. And one of the ladies went back and told the boy, they said no more prayer, right? And we couldn't uplift the Lord. But then you demon over there want to sit there and praise your God and do what you want to do. But you're going to tell me. And so <laughs> I, I sure did. I went the next day and I praised my God. And how are you? I'm blessed and highly favored. And she went back and told us. So the boy came to me. I said, you're telling me. Now that's where the freedom of speech. I'm not over there bothering her. But I can stay in my area. Okay. And I'm not ashamed of the gospel because what's in you going to come out. And God have always, that's why I don't understand. I get it like Pastor's saying on his job. But then you want to sit over there talking about that you, what is it, atheist. But then you can't respect me because. Well, and then and then the big you know, issue. I tell you I'm saying, but then you want to come up. No, that's that's not the way God works. And he always, I believe this, that he will see us because I, you know. He don't allow me to be in those situations. I'm talking about making four thousand dollars a month, okay? And I was like making good money, but I never ever backed off who I am or whose I am. You see what I'm saying? I never. Well, never and, and and it's not really about. It's not really about what other people do. My issue is this: everybody supports their cause for church folks. Exactly. That's what I was. Saying. The Muslims, they're going to have their thing. Yes. The 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 your your LBGTQs. Yes. They're gonna have their thing. The Masons. Uh, your Masons. Yes. They're gonna have their thing. I mean, yes. your 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 Nazis are gonna have their thing. The KKK gonna have yes. their thing. The Republicans yes. gonna have their thing. The Democrats yes. gonna have yes. their thing. Yes. The only people that will not stand up for what yes. they believe is church folks. Exactly. We will pick up the newspaper and we will see. Where they are teaching our four, five, six year old children curriculum that is 100% against what we believe. And we won't even go to a PTA meeting. That's right. We won't even go down to the school and at least voice our discontent because we're so afraid somebody's gonna mess around and do us like they did Peter and say, You was with him. So, again, there's going to be a day when you're going to stand before Jesus and Jesus is going to say to you what you've said to him all your life. He's going to say, depart. Take your cross. Take your clergy column. Take your, 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 your position and your title. You know, you're a pastor. 
you a bishop, you know, you're a deacon, you're a church mother. He's going to say, take all of that and depart from me. I never knew you. Because when it came time to live what was right, Amen. we didn't live what was right. And we don't try and learn how to exist in this world and be Christian. I heard the craziest thing I ever thought I would hear T.D. Jake say a couple of months ago when he was interviewed and they asked him if the LBGT community and the church could coexist. It was tragic. He was a man with the largest congregation in the United States. He had an opportunity to stand up and preach the gospel. And he stood up and said, well, you know, uh, each church has their own thing that they believe. There ain't no church that got nothing they believe. If you're not believing what God says, you're not a church. How are you going to be a church and be against God? And we let, instead of preaching the gospel, instead of preaching and teaching deliverance, we let the world come into the church and convert the church. This is why churches are all watered down and useless. Man, we watched some miracles happen in this church this year. Am I wrong? We watched some mighty things happen this year. Why would I run and allow people to come in, bring the stuff with them from outside, and let them infiltrate our church? You're not saved? Born again? Believe in God? You're not getting on that keyboard. You're not going to run no choir. I'd rather not have one. I'd rather run around here and do everything myself than let, than let somebody come in here that's not saved because we are reaching for members. But we're going to lose. Jesus says, what does it gain a man? What does it profit you? If you get everything you want out of your affiliation with the church and lose your soul, you're going to be a sad, it's, a sad, it's going to be a sad day because sinners know they're going to hell. The big surprise is going to be the Christians that wind up there. And they're going to find out that the Bible don't use Christian that often. The Bible has another word that it uses. It's called believers. Jesus is looking for believers. Make your point and then we're going to move on. Well, that's what well, that's what well, that's because nowadays we know preachers don't preachers don't preach hell no more. Man, if you mess around and listen to a couple of Joel Osteen sermons, you don't forgot about hell. The part I don't understand is we preach all the time about what God is going to how God is going to bless, but we don't preach what will happen when we reject. The greatest love God ever exhibited was to send his only begotten son. We treated him like dirt. Eventually, they killed him. And he willfully went to deliver man's soul from the grips of Lucifer, who was cast down in the earth. Lucifer is the, we're going we're gonna, to, I'm going to preach this on Sunday. He is the prince of this world. When God cast him down to the earth, the earth became his kingdom. And the only way he's going to find solace in his existence is, to, is by seeing how many Christians, how many believers he can take to hell with him. See, unsaved folks, your devil worshipers, your witches, they've been somehow seduced because they are believers in witchcraft, into thinking that Satan 
is somehow going to win. But if you believe this Bible, you know that's not going to happen. And so they actually will try and convince you that there is no hell. But you sit in church. You've got a Bible in front of you. Jesus preached more about hell than he did about heaven. That's another reason we're studying the Gospels. Jesus preached more about hell and hellfire than he did about heaven. Because he knew the benefit of heaven is great. But the torment and the disaster of hell is eternal and it is it is brutal beyond anything we will ever be able to comprehend. And then John tells them in verse 7, when he sees the Pharisees and the Sadducees, he calls them an old generation of vipers. Now, I am not necessarily against attacking the Christian faith. I believe you have to be careful about attacking the Christian faith because the church is the bride of Christ. So even when we are in error, you want to be careful how you attack the church. God said, touch not my anointing. Do my prophets no harm. Now I can call sin, sin, but we want to be careful to not make every church like the church of the flat rock. People are teaching things that's not biblical. That's why their churches are full. Then you got preachers that are preaching the true gospel. This is why we have so many small churches. Then we have churches where preachers, we've got big churches. I'm a great admirer of my Bishop Patrick Wooden, Bishop Blake. They have huge ministries and they live holy. I know they live holy. I grew up around them. I don't know what T.D. Jake did when he was young, but I watched Patrick Wooden come up through the years. I know how he lives. I have no problem believing that mega church is brought up in holiness. But we got to teach it God's way. John called them old generation of vipers, not a group. He didn't say you vipers. He called them a generation of vipers. We are living in a generation that, does n that no longer believes God. Because the world has been seduced into thinking that no matter how bad we are, God will find a way of saving you. This is why the Bible teaches that the only unpardonable sin is to deny what the Holy Spirit is doing in that the Holy Spirit is promoting Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of the living God. When you deny what Jesus did on the cross, and when you deny what the Holy Spirit is doing in the life of humans on behalf of Jesus, God will not forgive that because he has given us every opportunity to come. And don't give me this thing about uh, uh, God not choosing some people. I'm not a Calvinist. I don't believe in limited grace. I heard my Bible say God would that all would come unto repentance and receive the gift of eternal life. And the gospel will be preached. And some of us, and here's something else you need to recognize. You don't want to preach with your mouth? I'll tell you what, Willie, live the gospel. You, most people, you would get further living the gospel than preaching it. Everybody can't be a preacher. But everybody is an evangelist. We all have the ministry of reconciliation. So if you live God's anointing, people will see God's anointing on you. And they will be drawn to that. What will he got that I ain't got? I mean, he black like me. 
We live in the the same neighborhood. But he always looking like he's all right. And I'm always in Lodabar. It's God's grace. It's the anointing. It's called peace. Like a river. When you have God's peace, hell can be all around you. But you have God's peace. The Bible says that God knows how to bless the righteous in the midst of the wicked. Living holy is not hard. The Bible says that the life of the transgressor, we've got to learn how to live holy and stop being sound bites. We got to study this Bible. We got to live this Bible. Get out of get out of that TV. Stop watching Hollywood Christianity. We was preaching about that Sunday. People started talking about the three wise men and, 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 and how, how, how Adam and Eve ate the apple. Ain't nothing in my Bible about no three wise men or Adam and Eve eating no apple. When people tell me that, that tells me they ain't read their Bible. One thing I love about the church of God in Christ, the church of God in Christ teaches the Bible. Church of God in Christ preaches the Bible. Not to say that other churches don't. But I know what the Church of God in Christ does. So he says, O generation of vipers, who have warned you to flee the wrath to come? Now, here's what they saw. They saw John baptizing in the Jordan River. They had huge crowds of people in spite of the influence that the high priests and the Sadducees and the Pharisees had. Imagine that. Here they are, the leaders of the Jewish culture. And they come down to a river. And they see a guy looking like a camel herder with hundreds, maybe even thousands of people he's baptizing. Then later on, John gets him some disciples. And they start baptizing, preaching the gospel, saying, repent, repent, and baptizing. Now, here comes the high priest and the Sadducees. They are more threatened now than Herod was. Because they're like, wait a minute. Now our power and our influence is being threatened. We watch some of our international church bodies. I watch the Roman Catholic Church. What do I see when I, whenever you, I see the Roman Catholic Church in action, I think about the Sadducees. It's about power and influence. It's not about God. These guys stopped preaching the Bible a long time ago. And so what they were doing, they watched John come in Preaching the gospel of Christ, which also demonstrated the power that the gospel has. If you preach the gospel, God's gospel, with just a little bit of anointing. What what does it take to have a little bit of anointing? Live right. I mean, I've dropped the ball. Repent. Keep it moving. Now, when we say we are believers, it means If I drop the ball and repent, sinning ought to catch you by surprise. When we're born again, what we're saying is we're not in the sin business. It don't mean I won't sin. But when I do sin, it should catch me by surprise. Oh, man, I I, I, I didn't. It it just happened. It should not be something I got up this morning and planned. You got to be careful when you're doing that. You might be living in a backslidden condition. You're certainly a carnal believer. But what John is, so what they're seeing, they are intimidated by what they saw. And then John says to them, who warned you? Then he tells them, bring forth, therefore, fruit, meat for repentance. What does he mean by that? What he is saying is, 
You need to repent. What he is saying is you've got things going on. If nothing else, y'all have things going on in your theology that you need to repent of. John knew they didn't like Jesus. And I'm sure Jesus knew they didn't like Jesus. So John is telling them, I know you. I know y'all's lifestyle, which is why John preferred to live in the wilderness. Sometimes you're better off living somewhere by yourself than around a lot of folks that, that if you can't live holy. Saints, let me, let, me, let me suggest this. If you want to live saved, find you saved people to be around. I know you can't control that at your job, but you can limit the people you affiliate with. Certainly you can eliminate people that are, that are, that are putting things in your spirit. You got people sitting around you. There's some folks on the job, they cuss like sailors. <laughs> Cuss like sailors. You ought not to have a problem saying to them, you've been working with them 10 years. You ought to at some point have enough guts to say, excuse me, I really would appreciate it if you don't use profanity around me. Just like they tell you, don't talk about God around me. Just say to them, I really would appreciate it if you didn't use that foul language around me. But you know, Pastor, now, uh, and then you, some, you got weird, like you said, you just live holy. You if you just holy. live holy, some stuff you ain't got to tell people. I have had, you know, what you call it, the cuts. I've been, she can go. But the Lord bless where, you know, if they are slipped up, I'm, I'm sorry. I mean, I got family members. They cuss like sailors, and they'll say nine times, ooh, 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 I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. because they, 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 they use profanity so much that it's just part of their conversation. But when they realize they've done it, they say, ooh, ooh, I'm sorry. Non-Christians appreciate you living like a Christian. Y'all think that, that, especially like our relatives, and our relatives are tough, a tough crowd, because they knew us when we was out there wild and wet. Then all of a sudden you done got cleaned up and you think you somebody. No, but I'm living for the Lord now. I realize I was a scoundrel back in the day, but I'm living for the Lord now. And then you got to live it. One thing about your family, if you want to know how you live and you want to know how saved you live and willing, go around your family. They'll let you know how you live it. They'll let you know, you know, hey, hey, you know, look, don't be trying to act safe now because passed over here and we was at your house the other night drinking all that beer. You didn't say a word. And now pastor over here, you want to tell us to put the beer away. Well, at least you had respect for the pastor. Well, praise the Lord. So John is, so John is telling them that. Then John knows what they will say, and we're going to end it here. Praise the Lord for a great lesson. John knows what's in their heart. We are the seed of Abraham. We are the prophets of old. I'm a sad, you see. Huh, because I'm sad, you see. I'm, a, I'm, I'm of the Sanhedrin. I'm, I'm a Pharisee. I'm a scribe. I'm a lawyer. They were perfection in the law. And so they're looking at John like, who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? So a person got some money. They got some status. And they look at you. And you are born again. You believe God. You living for the Lord. And they look at you and they assume, they assert, because they have means, because they have money, because they have influence, even power, that they are above you. But I'm going to read to you again what David said in Psalms 33 and 16. There is no king saved by the multitude of a host. A mighty man is not delivered by much strength. 
A horse is a vain thing for safety. Neither shall he deliver any by his great strength. God is in control. And if you're God's anointing, God is going to protect you. And if you can't do nothing else, just live holy. So John tells them, you know, they're looking at him like we are the seed of Abraham. And John looks at them. And what John says to them is, hey, don't even think it. Here I am, uneducated. I don't even know if John could read. But John had the Bible in him because God put it in him. And he told them, don't think within yourself we have Abraham as our father. Then John said something profound. He said, for I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. So what he is saying is, being the seed of Abraham don't mean nothing. Don't tell me your mama saved and my daddy is a preacher. What are you? We know what Abraham was. What did, what did the devil tell the seven sons of Sceva? He said, Paul, I know. And Jesus, I know. But who do you think you are? So John is telling him, you can't live on Abraham's coattail. You can't live on the prophet's coattail. It was in the book of Ezekiel and Leviticus when God told Israel that the children shall no longer bear the sins of the father. And the father shall no longer bear the sins of the children. You in this thing on your own. You can't live on mama's salvation. You can't live on, on daddy's salvation. And sometimes we make mistakes in the church. Because I'm a bishop. I make my son a bishop. And my grandson a bishop. My son didn't even want to be saved. But I made him a bishop anyway. So what you did was you caused a real problem in that person's life. And in the church. They got to live it for themselves. I can't call my son. To be no preacher. I can't call myself. To be no preacher. Can't no preacher call me. To be no preacher. Now they can ordain me. If I'm affiliated with a church organization. Only God. Can call you to preach. And if God didn't call you to preach, you don't have no business in the pulpit. And if God called you to preach, you ought to be preaching what God said. So how are you going to call yourself a preacher and won't preach the Bible? Somebody tell T.D. Jakes what I said. We, 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 we got to go. God bless you tonight, saints. We will finish up on Sunday. We're going to roll over into chapter 4. And we're going to start digging in to what Jesus himself is saying in our series, Molded by the Master. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand. Come on now. Come on, Sister Lavin.